All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patty Adair, and I'll be your MC today for the sixth US China EU Product Safety Summit. Welcome to everyone here and to all listening on the webcast. Before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping uh, notes to announce. First of all, we have live interpretation of English and Chinese, and so please get a headset if you haven't already. Um, the fire exits. In the unlikely event of a fire, please exit at the marked exits. And the ladies' and gentlemen's restrooms are found outside in the hallway across the lobby from the security desk. Now, for this summit, we want to stay on schedule. So please be mindful to return from breaks on time. If you leave this, this floor, you're going to have to go back through the security screening. So please take that into consideration because it will cause a delay. At the end of each panel discussion today, the panelists will take questions if we have time. When you arrive today, you should have found some note cards on your chair. Um, and if you think of a question that you'd like to ask, please write it legibly on the card and hold it, the card up for somebody to come and pick it up. You can hold up a card during the panel presentations. You don't have to wait till the end. And the moderators will uh, choose the questions from the cards and determine the time that we have left and the relevance to the discussion. If you are watching remotely, you can submit questions to international at cpsc.gov. Speaking of watching remotely, please encourage your friends to tune in. They can watch at the webcast at www.cpsc.gov forward slash live. We also have Wi-Fi here. And you can see the passwords on the monitors, and, and they're posted a few places around the room. And finally, our hashtag today is hashtag safer products for all. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Acting Chairman Burkle, who will make a few remarks. Thank you very much, Patty. Vice Minister Young, Deputy Director General Morillo, my uh, fellow commissioners, I see our newest commissioner here, Dana Biacco. You might want to stand up and introduce yourself. Our newest commissioner here at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I don't see any of the other commissioners here. Distinguished visitors and esteemed colleagues, it is truly my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the sixth Trilateral Consumer Product Safety Summit among the central government product safety authorities of China, the European Union, and the United States of America. These summits have been a key element in the fruitful cooperation among our three governments. The Chinese government has recently undergone a reorganization, and the colleagues with, we, with whom we cooperated with in the ASIQ now find themselves in the General Administration for Customs. And now, although the mail gets delivered to a different address, their product safety mission remains the same. I want to just express my appreciation to all of the delegation who's here from China because, as you know, they are undergoing a reorganization, and it took a tremendous amount of diligence and hard work for them to get here today to make this summit all that much more meaningful. And so I do want to express my appreciation to you for participating. Based upon my conversations thus far with Vice Minister Yang and Deputy Director General Fonseca, we will continue our trilateral engagement and our cooperative efforts to ensure the safety of the products made used by our consumers. As you will witness here today, we are also very interested in the viewpoints and the perspectives of the full range of stakeholders that we serve as evidenced by the full engagement of all three agencies in developing and delivering this afternoon's public program. You might be interested to know that the trilateral summits grew out of a project back in 2008, when the CPSC's chairman, a European commissioner, and their staffs did a three-city joint industry training in China 
joined at each stop by AQSIQ officials, and concluding with the first trilateral summit in Beijing. We have reconvened every two years since then. The summits have laid the foundation of trilateral work that has produced substantive, tangible outcomes benefiting consumers in all three of our jurisdictions. And while the interest of U.S. stakeholders is my priority, it is certainly gratifying that all three of our jurisdictions reap the benefits of our cooperation on product safety. We have cooperated on rapid reaction to safety threats such as battery fire in hoverboards, jointly pressed suppliers to institute production practices that will assure product safety, and undertaking on-site training for industry regarding our safety requirements. As you will hear today, we also committed ourselves to working more closely with e-commerce companies to help them ensure that their sellers understand and follow our requirements. One of the principles that has ensured a good working relationship among our three governments on product safety matters is that we have been free to engage with each other on safety and to fo focus exclusively on safety issues as well as can keeping the consumer safe. Vice Minister Young and Deputy G Director General Murillo and I have discussed this and we will have committed to each other that we will remain focused on product safety. Yesterday we held trilateral government meetings. Our staff locked themselves away in the, this very room for several hours with the assignment of working out further practical mechanisms for our collaboration over the next several years. As you will hear today, our three organizations are now building on solid accomplishments. And when our staffs reported to us yesterday at the end of their meeting, I was very impressed and very pleased. Before I turn uh, this over to my colleagues for their welcoming remarks, I would also like to thank everyone who has come here as, as Patty did in her opening remarks. The views and the um, opinions and the thoughts and the expertise of all who are involved in product safety is very valuable to me as the acting chairman of this commission. We cannot be the experts in every, in every issue on every product, and many of you are, and so your willingness to share your expertise, your willingness to participate in the North American Summit and now today in this trilateral summit is tremendously valuable to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and so I wish to express my very sincere appreciation to all of you for your willingness to participate. With that, I would ask Vice Minister Young.女士们、先生们，大家好，非常高兴与大家见面。自2008年第一届峰会以来，中美欧三方为了一个共同的目标，开启了消费品安全领域的良好合作。经过十年的不懈努力，我们消除误解，增进互信，分享成果，积累经验
构建了以风险管理为基础的事中事后监管制度，以风险监测为核心的质量安全风险监控体系制度，以跨境电商企业为主题的责任追溯机制等在内的跨境电商消费品安全检验监管制度，对电子商。对电子商务消费品的安全监管更加科学有效。在新兴领产品领域，运用物联网技术试点开展进口医疗器械等产品的安全监管，相关法律标准也在不断完善。目前，大量产品依托第三方平台进行销售，三方一致认为。第三方平台的自律监管对于产品安全发挥着重要作用，因此，中方在去年多双面的会谈中提出了邀请平台企业参加此次峰会，得到了美欧的积极响应。CPSC 为实现电商平台参与本次峰会做了大量筹备工作。今天，中国、美国。欧盟的几家龙头平台企业将以业界利益相关者的角度参加接下来的讨论。中国有四家电商平台企业代表参加会议。第三方平台企业的参与，让各方有机会更广泛的。女士们、先生们，大家下午好，非常高兴与大家见面。Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to meet you all. 自二零零八年第一届峰会以来，中美欧三方为了一个共同的目标，开启了消费品安全领域的良好合作。From the first summit in 2008, China, Europe, and China, U.S. and Europe, for the same aim, we launched the good cooperation in the area of consumer product safety cooperation. 经过十年的不懈努力，我们消除误解。经过十年的不懈努力，我们消除误解，增进互信，分享成果，积累经验，有效解决了跨境产品、跨国产品安全监管领域遇到的实际问题。After ten years of persistent work. We are make efforts in、uh, reducing the misunderstanding, strengthen, mistru,、uh, strengthen mutual trust, share the outcome, and collect the experiences, and effectively solve the problems that we meet during the transporter、uh, actions of the consumer product. 在保护消费者权益、提升消费品安全水平方面起到了积极的作用。And it played an important role in protecting. Consumers' rights and elevate consumer product safety. Excuse me, I apologize. The transmitter now has been fixed. If you turn your、um, device to channel three, channel three, it was on one, but it should be on three, and I think you'll hear better. Let's try that. This will do simultaneous interpretation now. Through十年的不懈努力，我们消除误解，增进互信，分享成果，积累经验，有效解决了跨国产品安全监管领域遇到的实际问题。在保护消费者权益、提升消费品安全水平方面起到了积极作用。三国峰会已逐渐成为全球
。中国政府历来高度重视消费品安全，近年来，通过消费品风险监测、风险评估、风险预警、风险处置的一系列措施，进出口商品消费品质量安全风险预警和快速反应监管体系不断完善。在跨境电商消费品安全领域，构建了以风险管理为基础的事中事后监管制度，以风险监测为核心的质量安全风险监控体系制度，以跨境电商企业为主题的责任追究机制、追溯机制等在内的跨境电商消费品质量安全监管制度。对电子商务消费品的安全监管更加科学高效。在新型产品领域，运用物联网技术试点开展进口医疗器械等产品的安全监管，监管法律和标准也在不断完善。目前，大量产品依托第三方平台进行销售，三方一致认为。第三方平台的自律监管对于产品安全发挥着重要作用，因此，中方在去年多双边的会谈中提出了邀请平台企业参加此次峰会，得到了美欧的积极响应。CPSC 为实现电商平台参与本次峰会做了大量筹备工作。今天，中国、美国、欧盟的几家龙头平台企业。将以企业界利益相关者的视角参加接下来的讨论。中国有四家电商平台企业代表参加。第三方平台企业的参与，让各方有机会更广泛、全面地聆听关于消费品安全问题的声音，让跨境电商领域的消费品安全监管与自律更精准、更高效。今天上午，我与布尔克尔主席、范范扎卡副司长共同就消费品安全监管领域的新趋势、新问题进行了讨论，充分交换了意见，达成了共识，并一致通过了三方联合声明。这将是未来两年甚至更长时期内我们三方合作的方向。指引，提升消费品安全水平，保障消费者切身利益，是我们每个人的义务，也是无国界的、全球的共同责任，是我们为之努力的共同目标。我希望，我也相信，通过此次峰会的研讨和交流，中美欧三方将在以往合作的基础上。继续加强消费品安全要求和政策方面的联络与沟通，加强风险领域的信息交流、研究与合作，针对重大产品安全问题开展执法合作，促进形成更加健康的国际消费品市场，让三方人民的生活更安全、更美好。谢谢大家。Thank you very much, Vice Minister Yannin. And I very much apologize for the technical issues we just ran into, but I'm glad we were able to get them corrected. Deputy Director General Vonseca, would you like to make some opening remarks? Dear Chairwoman Forkler, dear Vice Minister Sam, let me begin saying uh, how, and I think I speak on behalf of me and also the Chinese colleague, uh, how we have appreciated your hostage, the preparation, and the way that you have conducted this sixth uh, trilateral summit between United, in, uh, in United States, China, and European Union. Thank you very much. Uh, I am very glad to be here uh, with you because I think we have uh, some common priorities and challenges for the safety of our consumers. The joint press statement shows there are several points in common 
on which we can further build our cooperation. A key one, of course, is the safety of products sold online to consumers. Online shopping is convenient for consumers, but it poses certain challenges for product safety, and it is more challenging for authorities to control. In the European Union, for example, more and more consumers shop online. 57% of Europeans purchase online during 2017, and this percentage is expected to increase in the, in the coming years. And in my data are okay, these percentages are even uh, uh, higher in the United States, for example. The European Consumer wants, the European Commission, sorry, wants to protect consumers who need to be safe no matter whether they buy products online or in traditional shops, and no matter what, what country the products come from the European market. As we said in our joint statement, third-party platforms are in a unique position to play an important role in product safety due to the significant amount of products sold through their websites. It is why the European Commission has started a constructive dialogue and cooperation with several online platforms on a pure self-regulatory approach. And at the same time, we are in a more regulatory approach. We are proposing in a draft bill present in April this year that uh, the pre-contractual information for consumer, where a consumer is buying on a platforms, are clearer for everybody. We are not imposing burdensome to the platforms. We are saying that you must identify yourself, explaining exactly the legal situation when a consumer is uh, contracting someone via your intermediation. Whatever you are a third person, a platform, or a, or a, or a buyer, trader, you must explain that in the pre-contractual information. This cooperation with some of them led to an excellent result which is some concrete voluntary commitment from their side to improve the safety of products sold through them, going beyond their legal obligations. The European Commission welcomes this voluntary initiative, and I would like to compliment the signatory companies. Some of them, and, and I am very pleased to see present, present here, to share their wits with other players in the market, as well as with our international partners. Our hope, is that more and more such players selling products to European consumers will join this voluntary commitment. But that is not the only challenge that we are facing today. Consumer safety and trust is paramount also when it comes to the success of new technologies, technologies such as, for example, connected products. New technologies can bring more opportunities to consumers making their life easier, but also pose some new hazards that can relate to product safety. Today, we will be able to discuss about all those topics with stakeholders with stakeholder representing consumers and industry from United, United European Union, United, United States, and China. I very much welcome this opportunity to share views on the newest trends and global product safety challenges with the aim of finding common approaches to face them and to continue our joint efforts on consumer product safety. I don't resist to finish with uh, a personal quotation of Thomas Jefferson, because I was uh, last Sunday visiting the memorial. And we are talking on a new world, a new newest thing, but the secret of Thomas Jefferson is still modern. The secret was more or less with the regulators. We are here to ensure the public health of people. So we intervene with people can't ensure by themselves this security. Thank you very much. Let me say, express my appreciation to both of my uh, colleagues here up on the dais. Um, and on behalf of my team, our US CPSC, uh, we want to extend our appreciation to both of both countries for the cooperation uh, that was extended to us uh, and that has merely made our partnerships so fruitful. We're delighted to have all of you here for the summit. We're delighted to be here together, and I really do believe that this afternoon 
will be very fruitful and will lead to more opportunities for us to collaborate and work together to keep consumers safe. With that, I would like to ask Patty Adair to read the joint statement that the three countries have put together uh, for today's, for purposes of today's summit. How about now? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. It is my pleasure and honor to read the joint statement. Uh, since 2008, the central product safety authorities of the United States, China, and the European Union have pursued joint efforts to strengthen non-food consumer product safety and protect the end consumers. Previous consumer product safety trilateral summits have led to improved information sharing and regulatory cooperation among the tripartite participants in order to promote the highest levels of consumer product safety. During this sixth high-level consumer product safety trilateral summit held today in Bethesda, Maryland, Acting Chairman Anne Marie Burkle, Vice Minister of General Administration of Customs of the People's Republic of China, Chong Zhuin, and Deputy Director General of Directorate General for Justice and Consumers of the European Commission, Francesco Fonseco, took stock of the accomplishments of recent years, gathered input from a wide range of stakeholders, identified areas for joint work in product safety, and developed a path forward for future cooperation. This summit focused on the product safety challenges presented by e-commerce, innovative products, and recurring product safety issues, such as products using high energy batteries, for example, lithium ion batteries. The event provided the participants a chance to hear from a variety of stakeholders on consumer product safety matters of interest to them. The safety of consumers is the key area of shared consume, c concern for the tripartite participants. The participants have achieved positive results to, to improve consumer product safety through unilateral actions, through the framework of bilateral cooperative mechanisms, and through trilateral joint activities. Two, the development of e-commerce has created new challenges for government authorities responsible for consumer product safety in particular concerning, concerning the surveillance of the safety of products sold online. The tripartite participants see collaboration with key stakeholders as fundamental to addressing consumer product safety issues in today's global markets. In particular, the participants view the rise of e-commerce and direct-to-consumer sales, together with rapid growth in the number of online sellers as developments requiring new strategies to ensure consumer safety. They regard easy access to information about product safety requirements as essential and look for increased collaboration with third-party platforms as a key element in outreach efforts. You're not done yet. Three, as concrete measures to improve product safety information delivery to online sellers, the participants are taking steps to ensure that each of their jurisdictions will have available a web portal providing the public with appropriate information on the jurisdiction's consumer product safety requirements. These resources can be used directly by e-commerce suppliers and promoted by third-party platforms to their sellers in order to help sellers meet product safety requirements, including for cross-border sales. Four, third-party platforms are well-placed to play an important role in product safety due to the significant amount of products sold through their facilities. Therefore, the tripartite participants welcome participation by several leading platforms during this Consumer Product Safety Summit as well as voluntary efforts already underway by third-party platforms to ensure the safety of products they offer on their websites. 
the participants view as essential enhanced collaboration, collaboration between third-party platforms and public authorities responsible for product safety, as well as continued efforts by the platforms to help ensure that only safe products are offered by their sellers. To the right place here. Five. The tripartite participants also think it is essential to strengthen collaboration in the studies of risks to manage risks associated with emerging products. They also wish to cooperate where appropriate and within the limits of their legal authorities and resources, its enforcement and enforcement in major product safety matters. Six. The tripartite participants received, reviewed, excuse me, renewed their commitment to encouraging the adoption of a culture of safety in product design, manufacturing, marketing, and in the supply chain. Moreover, they encouraged effective traceability of products to enable industry and governments to intervene quickly to prevent harm to consumers. The tripartite participants also renewed their commitments to collaborate in outreach and training activities and to continue to strengthen communication regarding consumer product safety requirements and policies, especially for new rules and policies and other significant changes. Thank you very much, Patty. That concludes our uh, opening remarks here from the dais. So at this time, we are going to leave the dais and allow for set up for the first panel. Thank you very much. Is this on? I think so. It's time for our first panel, Consumer Product Safety in the Digital Age. Uh, the panel is uh, headed by Rich, Mr. Richard O'Brien, who's our Director of International Programs at the CPSC. Rich will moderate the panel and introduce the panelists. Thank you, Patty. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, an unprecedented situation here. I, I don't think that there have been in one place um, a collection of uh, representatives from the major e-commerce companies um, sitting at one table together. If it has happened, I'm sure it hasn't happened very often. So we're very honored um, and, uh, and I feel personally very honored to be here to be able to moderate this discussion. Uh, the first thing I guess I should do is introduce the panel. Um, and moving from my left to right, uh, from my left, your right, uh, first of all is um, Mr. Zhao Shanghai. He's the Vice President, Platform Governance Department at Alibaba. And uh, I think many of us know that Alibaba is certainly China's largest uh, e-commerce company, perhaps um, the largest in the world, depending on how you define it. Um, Next from Amazon is Anthony Afre, Worldwide Director of Product and Food Safety and Compliance. And uh, defend, depending on how you define it, perhaps the world's largest internet retailer. And I'm going to let you guys do that one out at your convenience. Um, next from eBay, Mike Dabbs, Senior Director of Government Relations. I'll just say they're huge at uh, eBay. Um, a very popular auction site that I think most of us are familiar with. Um, next from Etsy, uh, Jessica Kahlberg. Uh, she is the policy manager, and um, Etsy is very well known for its handmade and vintage items. And then um, XBN, not so very well known, Li Jian. She's the vice general manager. I think in the United States, you almost have to be in the internet and e-commerce business to know who XBN is. Um, but they're um, a huge e-commerce infrastructure company. And we'll hear a little bit about how that um, relates to the discussion that we're going to have today. So thank you all. Uh, as you heard, our session is entitled Consumer Safety in the Digital Age. 
But as we've been preparing for today, we've been focused almost, almost exclusively on the e-commerce aspect of the consumer digital environment. Namely, what can be done to help ensure that consumers who order online receive products that are safe, meeting the requirements for the jurisdictions where they live? And more specifically, what can governments and e-commerce companies do to reduce the instances of non-compliant sales? This afternoon, we're going to get a look behind the scenes. We're going to learn about what is being done already by e-commerce companies in this regard, and a lot is being done. But first, we want to touch briefly on what governments are already doing. In Europe, authorities there have for several years been in close contact with the major online platforms, working out the removal of hazardous products on a case-by-case -case basis. Very recently, four major online marketplaces, and three of them here today, have signed a commitment with the European Commission for faster removal of dangerous products sold on their online marketplaces. In China, staff of the former AQSIQ, now located in China Customs following the recent government reorganization, has been doing risk assessment and post-market supervision on cross-border sales of consumer products. Here at the CPSC, we've, we've been increasing our contacts with the third-party platforms and also the information being made available online to manufacturers and suppliers on the ground in China, where we've been working with our Chinese and European colleagues to provide training to suppliers of popular products that frequently ship direct to consumers. You've heard in our joint statement just a few minutes ago, all three jurisdictions are committed to increasing collaboration with e-commerce companies in order to help them help us ensure that the products delivered to consumers are safe. Soon, all three jurisdictions will each have a web portal where suppliers can access product safety requirements for that jurisdiction. In addition, the three parties will each work on new product safety training directed specifically to sellers who use e-commerce platforms. Each of the five here today have agreed to work with us to facilitate the flow of this safety information to the companies using their services. Many of you are familiar with the CPSC's regulatory robot, the online tool to help suppliers and manufacturers understand our requirements. Right now, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Shelby Mathis, head of our small business office, who will share with you a preview of our new and improved regulatory robot that will go live in the near future. Shelby? Thank you, Rich. Um, let me get this up on the screen. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. O'Brien, for giving me just a few short moments to show a tool that uh, we here at the CPSC are very proud of and we're working to improve, uh, which is our regulatory robot. Uh, as Mr. O'Brien mentioned, we're looking to have this launch. Uh, at the end of this year, there is a regulatory robot available on our website currently. Uh, this new one will have some enhanced features, which I'd like to point out to you guys this afternoon. Uh, which would be multilingual capacity. You can see in the top uh, left-hand corner of the screen, the one that is displaying on your page uh, is available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. The robot will have several enhanced language capabilities and will be available on mobile viewers. The entry screen will look like this. You'll be asked to name uh, the report that it's going to generate for you. In this case, we're going to use a stuffed toy as an example. So we've typed in stuffed toy on the screen. And after you click agree and continue, you will move to our landing page, which asks you to select the category of product that you're making or importing into the United States. And we've broken down the universe of consumer products that are under the CPSC's jurisdiction into nine main categories. And if you are unsure what category you should select, you have the ability to use the search bar that is shown on the top of the screen or to um, 
click the question marks that appear in the top right hand corner of each of the nine categories of goods. The icons will be universal and we believe those will help people uh, understand what each of uh, what products fall into each of the categories but this will also be available in Chinese and we sh we can see on the screen this is what uh, the nine product categories page will look like uh, in Chinese. Because we're moving through the robot in this demo in a test environment uh, for stuffed toys, we will select the second category, which is toys and infant activity products, covering all of toys. And that will take us to a very few questions uh, that the new robot will ask you. The idea here being you will uh, be asked a series of questions. For toys, it's about five. You should be able to move through the robot in multiple languages in a few short minutes. Uh, you see two questions displayed on your screen here. Do you qualify as a small batch manufacturer? That term will be defined on the screen and you can hover over and get a description. Uh, and to pick a subcategory of good, in this case, again, we'll pick children's toys. And all of this uh, will eventually display uh, in multiple languages and you'll be able to toggle on the top left-hand side of your screen. The final two questions that you would be asked to answer if you were making or importing a stuffed toy uh, appear on your screen, which is whether or not you fall into two other categories of goods, play tents or rattles. Uh, in this case, you do not, so with a stuffed toy. So we have selected other toy and then highlighted three categories uh, that apply to our hypothetical stuffed toy for the demonstration today. Uh, after answering those questions, you will click generate final report which will generate a final downloadable report in your uh, native language that will list for you all the requirements that apply to the uh, product that you are making, in this case a stuffed toy, uh, or importing, um, and the requirements that would apply for the CPSC. We're very proud of the enhancements to the regulatory robot, and we look forward to demoing uh, and actually full launching this product uh, at the end of the year. And uh, I appreciate very much Mr. O'Brien's time today. We hope that everyone here will find this a very useful tool in the future with all the enhanced language capabilities. Thank you, Shelby. That's fantastic. And uh, a lot of credit to um, Shelby and her team for version two of the robot. And I think uh, it's fair to say that if e-commerce suppliers who are um, selling toys will use the robot faithfully, um, then we'll all be in a lot better shape when they sell on platforms, sell direct to consumers. So now we're going to move into the um, presentations by our panelists. And our first one is Mr. Zhao from Alibaba, who will tell us about what his company is doing to help keep consumers safe. Uh, thank you, Richard. And uh, I'd like to stand rather than <laughs> sit there and uh, feel more comfortable. So uh, maybe I can go to, go to the floor. And uh, uh, first of all, this, uh, today this is my honor and my pleasure to uh, attend this uh, trilateral uh, summit. And uh, I'm also very pleased uh, to see so many old friends. And because I used to work in the Chinese embassy here and uh, attended the, all the previous summit. And uh, for uh, today, that is, uh, I'll try to, uh, I'll try to uh, make introduction about, uh, uh, give you the overall picture of Alibaba. What is Alibaba? And, uh, and uh, then I will try to make uh, introduction on the uh, cross-border business as well as our management system. Uh, in terms of the control of the uh, cross-border e-commerce. So, I don't know, I need some people help me to <laughs> turn the page. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, well, I'm here. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, since I just have uh, uh, 14 minutes, so I, f I find it's a big challenge for me because I have a lot of information I'd like to share with you, but I will try my best. If I uh, exhaust my time, please give me a friendly reminder. Okay, thank you. And uh, so uh, uh, for the uh, Alibaba, that uh, it, it, it was first as an e-commerce company, and then it... Uh, 
uh, as time goes on and as the business is growing very rapidly and uh, then we turn into a high-tech company and uh, right now today that's as Jack Ma said that uh, we are already an economy and uh, uh, when, when he mentioned that we are an economy, that it means that uh, we must do more, and we must think more, do more, and take more responsibilities, and uh, try to establish the more open and more transparent, uh, as well as uh, more inclusive uh, platforms for all the stakeholders who are playing on our platform. Uh, so next page, please. I need to pay you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, th th this is the overall uh, picture. I I'm sure you can see it's, it's a little bit small. And uh, so uh, just to show you that uh, uh, the whole uh, economy, the whole uh, picture of Alibaba. So right now, we are trying our best to uh, establish and improve, further improve our infrastructures in terms of five platforms. One platform is for the e-commerce. Uh, that is, so we have Taobao, we have Tmall, and we, as well as we have the cross-border e-commerce, that's AliExpress, Lazada, and so on. So we try to uh, provide uh, uh, very good conditions for the sellers to play, to make their transactions on that platform. So today, that's for the overall uh, marketplaces, we have over 10,000 sellers on our, on, on our platforms. So the second one is uh, we have the Alipay, which will try to create a non-cash world and so that that's, uh, we can uh, further improve the efficiency of the transactions. As, at the same time, we try to uh, establish a, a, a kind of platform, a payment platform, which is uh, very healthy, uh, very, safety, very safe, as well as uh, environmental friendly and uh, resources saving. So this is our second platform. The third one is the logistics. So we, uh, as you know, that we established Cainia Logistics. We try to make use of big data and intelligence to organize the uh, delivery of the goods. And uh, so far, that's we already uh, as we, uh, established the kind of services like uh, 30 minutes delivery, one hour delivery. And in the future, that is our final goal is uh, to ensure the delivery within China in one day, 24 hours, and worldwide in 72 hours, the three days. So that's our uh, future work. And uh, then the next platform that is uh, uh, Ali Cloud Cloud Computing, we try to provide more services uh, to the uh, small and the medium sized uh, or for the, to the young people when they want to do uh, their own business on our platform. We try to provide them the services uh, in terms of the big data. And uh, the last one, uh, that is uh, the EWTP. I'm sure that uh, you already heard that as an electronic world trade platform. So uh, this is what we're doing right now. And uh, we already uh, had a very good cooperation with Malaysia, with Thailand. And uh, in the future, that is, uh, we will try to uh, establish the kind of platform which can uh, provide the conditions for the small and uh, medium-sized business as well as the young man, that uh, they can realize their dream to sell globally, to sell to different international markets. So next page, please. Uh, this is just, just to give you some uh, figure to show that our uh, development for the uh, Alibaba group, that is uh, in the year 2016, that's, uh, we already exceeded uh, 3 trillion RMB and, uh, in terms of GMV. And uh, last year, that is uh, 2017, that's uh, 3.7 trillion. And uh, for the single days, that's a uh, double 11, we call it. And uh, uh, for last year, that's uh, we already reached 168.2 uh, billion RMB for one day. Thanks. So this just uh, gives you, you know, some uh, thoughts that's about the future strategies of Alibaba. That in the future, very near future, we'll, we'll focus on the three points. That's uh, international business, rural business, as well as cloud computing. So certainly, as Jack Ma also mentioned, three new, uh, five new concepts. That's uh, new retail, new finance, new man manufacturing, new technology, as well as uh, new energy. So when we mention new energy, that is the data. 
he believes that in the future data will be the major uh, energy, major resources. Okay, so, so this is a, a very brief introduction about uh, uh, my, my department as uh, platform governance. So we have rules making, we have IP protection, uh, we have uh, sellers management, we have uh, as well the compliance. So next one. I'll try to move faster. So this is uh, the results we obtained last year that is in terms of the IP protection. So you can see I just uh, uh, make uh, two, uh, mention two items. That's, uh, that first one that is uh, last year that we have shut it down uh, 240 uh, shops which uh, have the violation uh, behavior in terms of the IP protection. So the okay this right now I come to the uh, cross border e-commerce since time so limited and uh, we have two ways of flows like one is for Chinese sellers uh, they sell to the global consumer through AliExpress through World Taobao and then global sellers they can also sell to the Chinese consumer through Tmall Global and the top and the global Taobao okay next one. And uh, right now, that's in terms of the cross-border e-commerce, that's uh, we, uh, our business already covered 220 countries and regions, and we support 18 languages. And right now, we have 300 million APP users. Okay. And uh, this is for the AE marketplace. That's, uh, we have, we, here we list the uh, uh, top five countries, like Russia, USA, Spain, France, and UK. And for the daily active users, we already have 60 million. And for the accumulated users, we have over 100 million. Okay. And uh, uh, this uh, piece of PPT that uh, shows the, our marketplace management, that's, uh, we try to do three uh, things. The first thing is the seller's determinacy. The second is the information determinacy, and the third is the product determinacy. So in terms of the sellers, that is, uh, uh, at the time they register with our marketplaces, then we will ver verify their real name, and uh, then whether it's the real person who is uh, operating uh, in our market. And uh, then maybe in the future with the technology advancement, we will use uh, like a biological ways to further verify. And uh, in terms of the product, uh, uh, display that is, uh, we also verify all the uh, information like licenses, permits, certificates, certificate certificates, or testing report, and so on and so forth, just to uh, to verify all the information uploaded by the sellers. And uh, the last one that is uh, for the quality control that is uh, for the product determinacy that is, uh, we try to uh, take make samples and to test the the samples we took from our marketplaces and to make sure that uh, what you see on the, on the, on the website, the, all the product information, they are fully in compliance with what you get. So this is uh, actually the biggest challenge for our, business, for our marketplaces. It's very difficult to make certain that uh, what you see from the website and is uh, fully in compliance with uh, what you get when you buy. So next one. And uh, this is uh, just, oh. Could not show display exactly. So this uh, actually is uh, our business. We try to have more control on the information side, and we try to give more information to the sellers in terms of the regulations or standards of relevant marketplaces. Like uh, when we export to the U.S., the U.S. that is, uh, uh, we will try to uh, tell the uh, tell the sellers that what kind of standard uh, they must follow. Uh, when they sell to the US, like they must have, uh, for some kind of product like toys, they must have a uh, UR mark and, uh, and relevant, the major testing uh, items that is, uh, they must uh, uh, show their concern uh, on those items. So we, so far that is, we can cover eight categories of products. Okay, next one please. Uh, so this is uh, uh, our pro problem oriented product testing. Uh, inspections. Just now I mentioned that uh, uh, we do uh, the testing just to make certain that uh, uh, to determine the product is the same as what is uh, showed online uh, for the information side. So in terms of the IP protection, that's we also uh, have our model to take samples and uh, to uh, intercept the goods from the logistic from delivery, and then we 
send those uh, goods to the brand owners so that they can make judgment whether those goods are the fakes, counterfeits or not, and then we will take action to the product as, to, as well as to the sellers. Okay, next one, please. Okay, yeah, almost. Uh, so this one actually is uh, to uh, show that uh, how we handle the cases we received from regulators, from com uh, cost, uh, consumers, and as well as from relevant agencies. That is, we try to uh, collect all the information from different channels, and then we will deal with them within 24 hours. So we will make analysis uh, and make assessment to the uh, cases, and then we will take action. And at the same time, we will also apply our actions uh, to other marketplaces within Alibaba. And uh, then that is, uh, we will, in 48 hours, we will give, try to give some feedback to the regulators or to the consumers just to tell them that what we have done. And then we, can, we will also make review of the cases to see whether uh, we need to adjust our rules and policies on our platform. So next one, please. So this is the new, pro, uh, new uh, pilot project we are try, we initiated uh, just recently. That is, uh, we'll try to ask the sellers to do more just to ensure the safety and quality of the product of the consumer products. So uh, we, need, we, we will ask the sellers to provide the certification number or testing report, so on. And then we, uh, we also will require the seller to uh, provide the main picture when for their pro when they want to show their product online, they must take a picture of their product to show the logo and to show the test uh, the certification mark on uh, on the so that that's uh, the, uh, the we can make more sure that uh, the product is actually is the same as what they displayed online, and then we use the manual check system right now, and then if it pass, and then we allow them listing. If not, we reject it. And in the future, we will try to use the auto-check system to review that part. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, this is uh, our cooperation with the government. We try to, uh, the regulators, we try to make full use of the data and information obtained by the uh, regulators, that's in terms of the certification uh, report or testing report, as well as other things. We also try to enable government authorities to do the investigations against the, the counterfeit or inferior quality products. So we have done a lot uh, in this side. And uh, also just a days ago, that's, we already signed uh, the code of conduct with the uh, EU. That is, uh, 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 this is a new development, actually, to show our cooperation with the uh, government authorities. As for the Alibaba, that is actually, uh, I want to say that we are very open and uh, we are very transparent and uh, we are always ready to further work, cooperate with the government regulators as well as others. So thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. That was great. And I think it's amazing. Um, we are in a world where our colleague from Amazon is advancing the slides for our colleague from Alibaba. <laughs> And if that is not peace in the world, I don't know what is. It's a good cooperation. It's a good cooperation, and it was done in public, so you're not in any danger of a regulatory violation. Okay. Yeah. I only one slide, so I think. Okay. Uh, all right. Should we just roll on? Ready to go? All right. Um, so my name is Anthony Ofrey, and other than turning the pages for uh, Alibaba's presentation, I am also the director for global product safety and compliance at Amazon. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to talk to you about Amazon. I'm going to talk to you also a little bit about uh, our product safety program. Um, so first of all, talking about Amazon, Amazon was created in 1994, and uh, since the very beginning, the vision has remained very constant. Uh, Amazon has always uh, aspired to be Hearst's most customer-centric uh, company, where customers can, uh, people can come uh, online and purchase uh, whatever they want to, uh, to purchase online. So that means that we've got a pretty large selection. Uh, we've got a selection of several billion products a uh, customer can uh, choose from around the world. And our uh, core business is made of uh, three main models. 
So one model is where Amazon is the uh, retailer and purchase goods, uh, store goods, distribute goods. In a second model, which is our marketplace model, the sellers are actually leveraging uh, Amazon website and uh, they own the product and then they distribute the product uh, themselves. And then we have uh, an hybrid model that we call, we call uh, Fulfilled by Amazon, FBA, which is a model where the sellers own the product, but they leverage both Amazon website and Amazon uh, distribution network. Regardless of those three models, uh, my team, uh, the product safety team, uh, is taking an agnostic approach, and, and the, the program I'm going to talk about is applying to all three models uh, equally. Um, and talking about my team, I think it's important. I wanted to share with you. Um, I've been a, a, a product safety and a food safety professional all my life, and uh, there's something that I do differently at Amazon. So when I started with Amazon, I've done what I've always done before, uh, which is to hire uh, subject matter experts, people with a science background like myself. Um, and uh, that works great. Uh, you know, it was give us uh, uh, credibility, first of all, inside of Amazon, and also the opportunity to put standards in place, make risk assessment in place, and that was very important. But I also realized that working and supporting billions of products, we could not do it like companies when they have uh, thousands of products. So I started to uh, assemble a team of uh, more tech people, software developers, uh, program managers, uh, business uh, analysts, business intelligence engineers, and it's a combination really of the two, the tech people and then the subject matter expert uh, people, the uh, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, the two combined are really setting our product safety programs apart, uh, different from, from anything that I've seen and definitely uh, different from anything that I've built before. So, um, that said, uh, our uh, Amazon product safety program is based on three main pillars. Uh, so I'm going to describe all, all three of them. The first pillar is a set of uh, uh, proactive uh, activities that are going to filter uh, the type of sellers and also the type of product that we sell online. The second pillar is an ongoing uh, monitoring uh, activities where we detect and we remove uh, uh, products that are defective. And then, very importantly, the third pillar is about uh, the education of our sellers. So I'll go into the detail of each of them. Uh, so that's what's on the slide, but it's a little bit small to read, so I'll try to be as descriptive as I can. Um, so the first step is when the seller is activating their account. When they activate their account, they have to provide information about their identities, they have to provide information about their bank account, how they're going to be paid, right? As they provide this information, uh, Amazon has developed tools that can recognize past activities from those sellers and recognize whether uh, sellers have a, a past of providing unsafe or a non-compliant product, in which case they would not be let activate an account. Uh, the second thing, the second part of the activity of the account is uh, for the, the sellers to uh, read, acknowledge, uh, and commit uh, to a set of uh, terms and conditions that include uh, a lot of safety and uh, compliance uh, requirements for product. So now our sellers is activated, uh, ready to operate. We've got uh, a, a number of steps uh, to control the type of product that can be offered on our platform. Uh, starting with something that we call restricted products. Restricted product is a program that we have in place to, to prevent certain product type from being uh, offered. So for example, uh, it is illegal uh, in, in most places to sell recreational drug. So we've got uh, um, tools in place to recognize when people are trying to list a recreational drug and we're not authorizing it. Uh, in a similar way, uh, there are categories that are maybe not illegal, but that uh, Amazon deems uh, not suitable for an online platform, uh, like uh, airbags. So for airbags, we have decided not to sell airbags, not because the airbags are going to be unsafe um, or non-compliant, but because the airbags require both the product to be safe, but also the installation to be done correctly. And that's something we cannot offer online. So we decided to restrict completely that uh, those product category. Um, and then for some higher risk uh, categories, we have also a program that is uh, 
requiring uh, uh, information from the sellers that are going to demonstrate their competence. So for example, in the toy space, we ask sellers to provide certificate of conformities. So uh, um, uh, children's product certificates in the US, certificate of conformity with uh, um, uh, toy directives, safety directives uh, in the EU, for example. And then so providing those uh, um, documentation that are going to be reviewed by our operators gives us a guarantee that the sellers is qualified, at least knowledgeable, uh, in, in the toy category. The next level up of filtration that we operate is specific not to the seller anymore, but to each product that the sellers wants to uh, uh, list online. So this is going to be the case, uh, for example, of squishy toys. So been a lot of activities around squishy toys recently. So not only the, the, the seller needs to be qualified to offer toys, but for squishy toys, they're going to have to provide a, a lab test certificate. So complying with uh, ASTM uh, F963 or EN71 uh, for us to let them uh, list that particular item. The second pillar of the program is around the activities we're taking to actually detect uh, products that are already listed. So everything that I've mentioned before was pre-listing, now we're talking about post-listing. Um, we have sophisticated tools that are using machine learning and natural language processing that are capable of detecting uh, what is relevant. So we receive uh, 21 million pieces of uh, customer feedback per week. Um, we have tools that are capable of sorting that feedback and to highlight which part of the feedback is relevant to product safety and compliance. So with uh, an example, so if we're, we're not just searching for, for words, but for, for context as well. So the word fire, for example. So fire can be used uh, for, as an expression, like the cells are on fire. So our system would be able to detect that cells on fire, not an issue. But if the, in, in certain contexts, our system will be able to understand that this is a, a fire with, with flame, actually, which is what we are, um, are looking for. And, and when we find this type of product, uh, we're going to have, we, we take down the product, and we're going to have an investigation uh, by subject matter expert. And the subject matter expert is going to contact the manufacturer, is going to contact potentially the customer, uh, make a search also in our warehouse with similar products. And based on that investigation, we're going to decide whether we reinstate uh, the product or if we're going to maintain it suppressed. Our recall uh, process is working in, in a very similar way that it uh, leverages uh, electronic tools uh, as well as uh, um, expertise uh, from our operators, from our associates. Um, so we're going to be able to very quickly and uh, effectively, first of all, monitor uh, uh, the, the website from the different uh, regulators available. We're going to detect recalls and we're going to uh, translate what the recalls means in terms of the product that are being carried on our online shop. And then uh, from this, we're going to immediately suppress the product, uh, also freeze the product wherever it is in our supply chain. And um, we have also the capability to very quickly uh, associate the customers that have ordered that product in the past and message them within hours of the notification. We're only going to reinstate uh, a product when two conditions are being fulfilled. First of all, our system is completely flushed out uh, from recall product, and also we receive a certificate of conformity from the manufacturers that new production have been made, and now the product is safe and compliant. The third pillar of our programs around uh, uh, the education of our sellers. So for that, we've done a lot of surveys um, to understand what, um, what our sellers uh, uh, wanted in terms of communication. And, and we, we realized that, you know, other than language that needs to be adapted to each of the sellers, which we've done, um, there's different format that works for different sellers. So we've developed videos, help pages, uh, e-learning modules, uh, websites. Uh, we've got newsletters, we've got online forums, and that really helps. So the customer, the, the sellers have an opportunity to uh, come and pick, you know, the contents that is relevant to product safety and compliance that works best for them. To give you an idea of, of the volume, last year we have developed uh, in 2017 200 new help pages. Uh, we also have a dedicated website called uh, uh, Seller University. Uh, that features uh, 400 uh, videos relevant to product safety and, and compliance. 
Um, and then our forums, uh, just in the past 30 days, have seen dozens of thousands of exchange between the sellers uh, and uh, our uh, seller support associates. So with that, before I close, I wanted to reiterate uh, that I believe in the partnership with, between the, the private sector and the public sector. I think there's uh, great opportunities. Uh, we have the same objective uh, to protect our customers or the public at large from uh, unsafe products. Um, we have developed for many years now uh, close collaboration as part of the uh, retail, uh, retailer reporting program with the CPSC. We are very pleased uh, to continue like, improving that program. Uh, a few weeks ago, you may have read that we've also worked with Knight, uh, uh, National Institute for Technology uh, and uh, um, Evaluation uh, in Japan, um, to replicate a little bit what we are doing with the CPSC uh, um, in the U.S. And then, you know, uh, also we have uh, developed. Uh, we have signed yesterday a memorandum of uh, um, understanding uh, with the European Commission. You know, with similar endeavors. And really where we see the collaboration uh, being effective is with all that data that we have in our hands. I mentioned before about those uh, 21 million pieces of feedback from customers on a weekly basis. You know, there's definitely a way for us not to just to share that data, but also to sort it with the tools that we have in a way that is meaningful and actionable uh, for the governments that we work with. Um, the, the se of course, we also expect, and we we expect to receive data, you know, from from the uh, the public authorities we are working with, uh, and uh, we see also an opportunities to work together in terms of uh, seller education. Um, so, you know, we we are connected uh, with a lot of sellers, uh, um, very well connected with the uh, upstream supply chain. And, and we welcome the input of the uh, public authorities, you know, for developing content that is going to be meaningful both for our sellers and, and what uh, the public already believes is uh, uh, working and appropriate. So um, to conclude, I'm uh, very proud uh, to have developed, you know, processes, tools, uh, to have uh, people in my team that are making Amazon Online Shop uh, a safe place for our customers. Uh, but I also uh, recognize that our work is never done, uh, that we always have uh, an opportunity to continuously improve. Uh, at Amazon, we say it's always day one, so we always pretend that it's day one. So uh, with this, I'm looking forward to uh, collaborate with you uh, in the future, and I want to thank you for your time and attention today. There's enough wire, so it should be able to go over. Thank you very much. Um, soon as Mike, okay, we're going to give him. Yeah, as soon as Mike has the laptop. All right, thank you. And I'm I'm just hitting arrows here. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so now we're going to hear um, from eBay. But thank you very much for that super presentation from Amazon. Great. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Can everybody hear me all right uh, in the back? Great. Um, so I, uh, my name is Mike Dabbs. I'm the Senior Director of uh, Government Relations uh, for the Americas, uh, based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, all of my colleagues up here are experts on this subject. Um, I do government relations day to day. A very uh, good and close colleague of mine, Mike Carson, who you, you may have met through some of your others, um, uh, is our regulatory policy lead. Uh, his wife is about to have a baby, so I told him this was his baby present that I'd come here and do this. Um, so I want to thank CPSC for doing this. This is these types of things are really important for us to come and, and meet other people and uh, uh, share information and, and uh, get to know colleagues. So it's a really important part of our process and how we look through uh, prohibited items and, and, and a way to keep the site. Um, uh, you know, as, as uh, free of, of prohibited items as, as possible. Um, so let me first start with this slide. Uh, uh, this slide is meant purely to confuse you, so you have no idea what I say from the rest of the time, so try to read every number. Uh, but eBay is one of the world's largest pure marketplaces. And by pure marketplaces, I mean that 100% of the products on our site are owned uh, and sold by third parties, uh, third party sellers to third party buyers. 
at this point, eBay doesn't touch uh, the payments at all either. Uh, uh, it's done through eBay, uh, PayPal, and eBay used to be the same company. In 2015, uh, PayPal split off from eBay. We're currently operating uh, under an operating agreement. Uh, eBay will get back into payments, but at this point, PayPal handles all of the payments. So we really don't touch the uh, transaction as, at all in between buyers and sellers, which makes for a unique experience in how we uh, go about policing our site and, uh, and being good stewards. A couple of big facts just to give you kind of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the makeup of, of eBay um, is that uh, Richard said that we were a large auction site. Richard, I have to get up here and brief you. Lots changed in the last 23 years. Uh, the uh, eBay is now 88% uh, is fixed price. So you go on and you buy right away um, uh, whatever product you want, 80% of which are new. 12% um, are still the auction site that eBay was, uh, was, was founded in, and, uh, and built on. Uh, at any one time, there's one, uh, or, or actively, uh, across all of our global markets, there's 1.1 1 .1, uh, billion active listings uh, on the site. 13.7 uh, um, million new listings come on our mobile uh, apps every single month. Uh, we're in 190 countries. Zhao, you're in 220 countries. Need to figure out what those 30 are because we kind of got to get in there pretty fast. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk after. Um, so, you know, the scope of, of, of how much is going on the site at any one time are, are problems that all of us up here uh, experience uh, every day in, in the amount of listings that are coming on the site and going off the site and coming on and going off. Um, all right, so here's just a quick in, in, uh, in, in talking through how eBay's business model works. So the, the seller on eBay will list uh, a, a product, uh, and, as, and there are all sorts of rules around what they can and cannot list, but the seller controls that content. They control how it's presented, um, the wording, the picture on the site. It's a, it's a, it's a purely seller uh, experience. Um, as I, I discussed, the item is going to be passed from the buyer, seller to the buyer, and eBay will never touch that product or be involved uh, in, in that whatsoever. I should also mention that we don't have a logistics business, right? We, we have different logistics solutions uh, that help our customers, but we don't have warehouses, we don't have trucks, we don't, we don't uh, get involved in any of that. So really 100% of from the sale to the buy is, uh, is between seller and buyer. Uh, the way eBay makes money um, uh, currently is that uh, it, it gets a fee from the seller for listing the item and then completing uh, the transaction. Uh, there are no, no fees on the buyer. So here's how we uh, go about you know, enforcing eBay's policies to ensure that prohibited items are off the site. Um, for the seller, there's a user agreement that they commit to that says they will not um, uh, uh, put up any item uh, that does not comply with eBay's rules, uh, and, uh, and those rules are always subject to change. Um, we enforce these policies religiously, and we do it um, by a lot of, of newer technologies and a lot of old school technologies. The newer technologies are we have filters so that um, certain items as they're listed cannot be priced. And I use the example of ivory tusks throughout this as just a consistent example, but if you list ivory tusk, uh, you're not going to be able to put that product on eBay's site. It will block you from doing that. Um, we have all sorts of sophisticated tools to search across sites and see what listings um, could be in violation of uh, illegal content uh, or recalls or, or that sort of thing. And then the old school way is we literally have a team of, of, of investigators that, um, that answer customer uh, alerts that say, hey, I think something's on the site that shouldn't be on, that do their own sort of, um, of searches 
um, uh, uh, much like the teams that Anthony was talking about, a way that, that really to, to just scrape and, and scope the site um, uh, uh, every day uh, to make sure that uh, illegal products are not on there. Um, we also collaborate heavily with, um, with law enforcement, uh, both uh, domestic and international, to exchange information uh, and stay on top of, of best practices. And then our customer support teams are really the front line. A lot of times we'll get a call, something may have been listed a little bit differently than, um, than you would have thought, and, and the customer may say, hey, I don't think that should be on your site, and then the customer service activates uh, uh, that complaint and then tracks it, tracks it back. So if you go on our site, everything's very clear and, and laid out. There's 54 different policies that walk through our prohibited and restricted items. Uh, you can go to this on eBay. It's very easy to find, of course. Uh, and it will list out each one and then go through that policy. We are changing these policies weekly or monthly to, to um, uh, be aligned with uh, new regulations or uh, you know, changes in, in, uh, in, in different countries and, and, and what's happening. So if an item is recalled, which is where we've just done extensive work with the CPSC uh, and, and um, uh, an area that, that we are very active in, um, we kind of list on our site how you can find out about recalled items. And this is both for seller information as well as for buyers. Um, when we do uh, uh, have a recalled item, we give it uh, three different ways. First is that it's allowed. Uh, it's not currently subject to a recall, um, that you know, potentially the recall had happened way in the past, that product's not subject to it, or, or so on, or just a product that was never subject to a recall to start. Uh, second is restricted. Uh, these projects are, are subject to a recall, uh, but the, the sale is not prohibited. Um, so it gives you links to, you know, questions, what you need to, to follow. For example, cribs, um, the federal safety standards, car seats, they have to comply with um, federal motor vehicle standards, uh, that type of thing. And then not allowed is currently under recall, not allowed to be, to be sold. So we try to make this very clear, very easy for, uh, for the seller to understand when, when listing. Um, we spend a lot of time on seller education. Um, so eBay is a, is a company that, you know, within it has, uh, in the U.S., hundreds of thousands of small businesses that operate uh, their businesses in part or in whole on eBay. Uh, internationally, we have millions of, of small businesses that, that do this. So keep, you know, feeding information to our sellers um, about, uh, how to stay on top of, of um, information and where to go to is a core, uh, a core aspect of what we do. Um, we do this in every country that we're involved. And uh, an earlier point is that uh, eBay has 26 sites globally. Um, big ones are the U.S., U.K., Germany, Australia, but you know Canada, Canada, Italy, Spain, others. But to the 190 countries. You can, if you're, you know, for example, if you're in Brazil and you want to get onto eBay and buy something, you certainly can or sell, but you'd have to access one of those 26 other sites since we don't have a Brazilian site. So you would go onto the U.S. site, you'd be translated in Portuguese, uh, you would list your product, you'd buy a product, and so on. So we really focus on those 26 areas where we have uh, sites, but then also every other country where there, there's a... Um, uh, an issue, uh, we, we um, try to have information and, and stay close with, with those, those regulators. So a core um, factor of what we do is, is global decision making, which means if there's any product that's banned in any country for any regulatory reason, um, that product will not appear on, on eBay's site. And we do this for that same reason of a buyer not trying to circumvent a country's laws by going to a site uh, uh, in another country and then just having that product exported or imported in. So Elvis is in the building. Everyone awake? 
Um, so one, one way we do this is um, in to find the listings and, and find how we identify this, um, we have a system that's called, that's called Elvis. And we flag these um, ones that are uh, different ways that we look at these, one of which is that we flag the items that potentially could be um, problematic for review. And so an example of this is to go back to the ivory tusk. We've seen different uh, pseudonyms being used um, for, uh, for what would be an ivory tusk. And you'll see something on there, something like, you know, ivory coast blankets or something like that that has come up before. Um, and that will catch on in the dark web. That will catch on within um, direct... Uh, um, conversations and then so you'll so our investigators will see more of a pattern of that on there um, now we haven't seen ivory tusks in a while but but uh, just using it as an example so those will get flagged there'll be an immediate investigation into is that really an ivory a blanket from the ivory coast or is that uh, a way just to get around the filter um, uh, if it is then, then of course it'll be blocked um, blocked is, is items that are no longer allowed and they're simply blocked. You can't list them uh, uh, if you try. Uh, and then messaging is, you know, we do a lot, again, messaging out to buyers and, and sellers. So how do we get our information for our filters, which is just critical? Um, regulatory agencies serve as, a, as such a huge source of information and collaboration uh, across the world. Uh, law enforcement agencies, as I've, as I've said, uh, industry, we have a, uh, um, really strong relationships throughout industry um, to, uh, uh, to make sure that um, uh, different products that, that, uh, that come up are, are, are not on our site. Um, internal, we get flags all, all sorts of ways, uh, and, then, and then member reports. So it's a real uh, a different, you know, differing basket of how we get our information uh, to keep the site policed. So here's two examples, um, both of which uh, you won't be surprised uh, are when we worked very closely with the CPSC, um, and but just ways in, in how this works. So you all remember the the, uh, the Samsung Galaxy phone problems. Um, we worked, you know, very closely both with regulators throughout the, the world, CPSC in, in the U.S. and others, as well as Samsung, uh, to both, you know, educate the user as well as block um, the listing so that when someone's tried to list a Samsung phone that was currently under recall, uh, they weren't allowed to do it. it. It gave them a link, as you'll see on the screen, to the CPSC, gave them more information um, so that these stayed off the site but that they, the seller stayed educated. Uh, second example are hoverboards, um, which we, we talked about a bit, uh, I think, at, at the very beginning in, in some of the examples. Uh, but again, here you'll see um, that we we give a problem for the listing that it's been blocked, uh, but we we give information of going to CPSC, and then if it's been certified to meet the UL um, standards, um, you know the ways to go about in uh, enlisting that. So. Um, you know, there's, there's the, the eBay company, if you know anything about the history of, of the eBay company, it was um, founded on the premise that uh, uh, the people are fundamentally good. Um, uh, but when you get 1.1 billion listings, sometimes that doesn't always happen. Uh, and so we have to go about very diligently in a, in a, in a process in what to do if uh, if this is being ab abused. So we've talked about how we remove our listings. The, press, the steps that we take with a seller, first time they put one on, we'll give them a warning um, uh, to take the, it off. We monitor that very closely. If it's not taken off, we take it off. Um, if they keep doing it, they'll get a selling restriction, uh, and very soon after they continue to abuse the rules, they will get an indefinite account suspension. Uh, and this does happen, and it, and it happens, um, I wouldn't say frequently, but uh, certainly enough. Um, and then, you know, what else can we do if sellers, you know, don't comply? We always work with the authorities very actively. Uh, we report illegal listings. Um, we, uh, you know, request suspension of criminal sellers' accounts, uh, and uh, we look for user, user data requests. 
So uh, thanks again for the time. Much appreciated. I uh, look forward to any questions. Thank you, Mike. And I, and I want to thank the panelists for um, observing the timing very carefully. Yes, I am sending them threatening notes, but they're being really <laughs> good about it, too. So Jessica at Etsy, what are you doing? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending, and thanks for all of the panelists. I'm going to try to fly through this a little bit quickly, being cognizant of time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what consumer safety means in a rules-based marketplace, which is slightly different from my colleagues on the panel. So I'm Jess Kahlberg. I am the head of global policy at Etsy. Our policy team is responsible for writing all of the rules and regulations for our members when engaging on our site. That's things that you can list for sale, what types of behaviors you can and can't do on our platform, what happens in case of a dispute, et cetera. You know, we write the terms of use that nobody likes to read, that they just sign up for and totally give away all of their rights, but you should absolutely read what you're signing up for. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, consumer safety on our platform, but first I want to talk about what Etsy is because we're kind of this small fish up here. Uh, so what is Etsy? Etsy is a 13-year-old global platform. Like eBay, we're a two-way marketplace. We don't hold any of the stock ourselves. We don't see it. We don't investigate it. We don't touch it. We don't hold any of the products ourselves. So we have about 2 million active sellers on our platform, and they specialize in selling handmade items, vintage goods, which are 20 years or older, and craft supplies. Uh, the majority of our sellers are individuals, so just a single person running their entire business, start to finish, creating their goods, listing them online, shipping them out. Uh, the majority are actually women, and most are based in the US, though we are a global platform. Uh, our buyers really come to our community to find things that they can't find anywhere else. We like to think of ourselves as the place that you go when you want unique goods. Um, when I think about recalls and consumer safety, my mind usually goes to recalls of food products, uh, large scale manufactured items, tires, baby products, things that you wouldn't necessarily associate with handmade or vintage, which is what you would find on Etsy. So the types of items that we see on our platform and the things that we write rules about are going to be slightly different. Though we do see recalls and safety violations in two main areas, which would be in handmade goods and vintage products. So we have five general steps for consumer safety. Again, keeping in mind that we never see the actual goods themselves that our sellers are listing. Uh, like Mike was mentioning, we rely completely on what our sellers are uploading on the internet. And while we would like to think that everybody is fundamentally good and doing the right thing and they're totally transparent, that's not always the case on the internet. So we have to have some rules in place for what happens if either they're mistakenly selling a recalled item or they're doing it on purpose. Uh, so I'll go through each of these items individually. The very first step, of course, is to create a policy around those items. Uh, these are screenshots from Etsy's prohibited items policy, and that's etsy.com slash legal slash prohibited. This is a super detailed policy that goes through the types of items that are regulated our, on our platform. That could be anything ranging from like hate speech, drugs, human remains, other strange things that we find endangered species. But we do specifically like to call out dangerous items and recalled items especially. Uh, this helps us show to our sellers as they're onboarding to our platform that they need to keep in mind that recalled items cannot be sold. And every seller on our platform is subject to this policy globally. 
So the next general area is identifying the risks of your platform. Um, recalled goods and consumer product safety, those are two huge areas, as I'm sure we can all attest to, especially those of you in the, the field. Um, when you're writing policies for your own platform, you need to really write ones that apply to the types of goods that you're actually seeing. So the risks for Etsy are not going to be the same for eBay or Amazon. Uh, what we did a few years ago, mostly in collaboration with the CPSC, is uh, we were talking mostly about vintage goods because that's where we see a lot of recalls. And the CPSC kindly provided us with a list of common vintage goods that are still available for purchase that are subject to recalls. Uh, we then compared that list to the types of things that we see listed on our platform. Not everything's going to appear, but we noticed that the main areas and things that we're seeing listed pretty frequently fell into a few areas, such as dropside cribs. Uh, we get lawn darts pretty frequently, and that's one area where people do know that they're recalled and they call it out in their listings, but they list them for sale anyway. Um, and we also see uh, corningware percolators that have been recalled because there's a lot of confusion about which ones you can and can't sell. On the handmade side, that's really interesting because there are constantly new trends, new types of products that are being listed and emerging in the marketplace. So we also work with the CPSC and other regulatory agencies just to notice what are the upcoming trends for us in handmade that usually falls into the categories around children's items, uh, hoodies with drawstrings in them, and something called baby bling, which was an interesting trend a few years ago where people were putting Swarovski crystals on pacifiers and other things near the baby's mouth. Very strange. Not sure that's an Amazon risk area, you know? <laughs> Uh, the next step, of course, is enforcement. Something that I say internally to my colleagues a lot is that I can write the best policy in the entire world and people can read it and really understand it, but if nobody's there to enforce it, there might as well not be a policy. Uh, Mike went through a lot of information about how eBay enforces their policies. Ours are pretty similar. Uh, we have a marketplace integrity team. They're based in our trust and safety group. And they use a combination of automated filters, machine learning, um, their own scrubs that they do themselves on the front end, just searching manually, um, as well as flags from our community. So anybody can go to any listing on Etsy, scroll to the bottom, and click on a link that says report this item to Etsy. You just fill out a quick form, and that'll be sent to our team of specialists to review and take down content. Um, we always see new tr trends emerging. This is not something we can necessarily predict ourselves. Uh, while we're experts in our marketplace, we're not experts in emerging risk trends and consumer safety concerns. So we do rely on industry experts to communicate with us. And then we're able to build that into our proactive enforcement. And I'm going to have a few different screenshots here on education because we think it's super important. This is another screenshot from our prohibited items policy. Um, as I mentioned before, the vintage items that we see most frequently, the corningware percolators, lawn darts, and dropside cribs, we wrote those directly into the policy itself. We did this a few years ago after years and years of taking these items down every single day and then receiving emails from our community saying, why didn't you tell me in the first place? I had no idea. Um, so we just built it in the policy itself. Seems like a good idea. Uh, when you see the word recalled items in Etsy Orange, uh, that indicates a link. So if you click on that, it goes to recalls.gov. That's a really amazing US-based website where six different regulatory bodies feed in all of their recall information. So you don't have to be an expert or know who exactly is the person who's managing that sort of like regulatory content. You can just go there and plug in the information and find a lot to about that. 
And that includes like the FDA, the CPSC, etc. Uh, these are some screenshots of our listing flow. So I would love it if every single person actually read the policies and memorized them and took it to heart. But realistically, this is the internet. You hit a checkbox, you don't read the thing, you just keep going. So we decided to build it into the way that sellers list their items for sale on Etsy. So the top screenshot is when you're choosing a listing category. So you type in the type of item that you're selling and we show you the types of categories that you list in. But if you're listing in a really regulated area, like for example, hoodies, which tend to have drawstrings, especially for children, we pop up this little message that say, says items in this category may be subject to legal and safety requirements. Uh, when you click on learn more here, this gives you a really robust FAQ that provides you with more information. So this one in particular is for children's clothing and products. We collaborate with both the CPSC and other international regulatory bodies to produce this content. Uh, like I mentioned before, Etsy is not the regulatory expert in this field, so we create this educational content as a collaboration so that we can provide links out to really fantastic resources so that our sellers get the direct information from where they need it. And another thing that we like to do is provide ways for our members to interact with each other and uh, get information and be able to give each other advice. So we have public facing forums where we've hosted some really great Q&As with some CPSC employees in the past. This is part of our Teams feature where sellers self-organize into small groups and they can help each other with their businesses. Uh, a few sellers on the platform created this group itself without any input from Etsy itself in 2010 in response the, to the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008 um, and the former CPSC small business ombudsman Neil S. Cohen would jump in, answer a lot of questions, provide a lot of feedback and that was really instrumental in helping people, especially small business owners in the U.S., feel a bit better when they're bringing their toys and children's items to market. And then finally, something that I think everybody here has mentioned is just continuing to reiterate on your policies. You can write the best policy in the world, but if you set it aside and never look at it again, it's going to be outdated really quickly. So it's really critical that we're constantly having that feedback with regulatory agencies, industry experts, colleagues in our field to update our best practices and industry standards. I've said it over and over again, we are experts in our marketplace, but we're not experts necessarily in consumer safety. We want Etsy to be the safest marketplace it can possibly be, and we can't do that without collaboration and help from all of you. So thank you so much. Jessica, uh, you will no doubt have noticed that we pushed back from the gate a few minutes late, and therefore um, we're not gonna land on time. But we do wanna hear um, completely from each one of our panelists. And uh, the content so far has been uh, super. Um, and I'm especially interested now, our last panelist, um, Chen, is from XBN, and as I mentioned at the front end, um, they're primarily an infrastructure provider, infrastructure and logistics, if I got that right. But we'll hear more about it and, uh, and how that intersects with the product safety world should be especially interesting. So please take it away. Thank you.
sorry for that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank, thank you, Richard, and thank you, everyone, to be here. Uh, I'm really honored to be here to share what our uh, experience and our perspectives about the uh, product quality control and the customer safety insurance uh, are from XBN. Yeah, comparing with all of the famous and leading ones, we are really small and young here. And I think everyone here are uh, thinking about who is XBN. Yeah, what is the three letters stand for? So I will spend a lot of time. Uh, I'm sorry. I will spend uh, some time to uh, tell everyone here what who is XBN and first. Yeah. Uh, here. Okay. Everyone can see it. Yeah. Uh, it's a bird here. Yeah. That is why there is a bird here because that's uh, where our name came from. Actually, experience. XBN, this three letters is the initial letter of our Chinese name, which comes from a Chinese uh, idioms that come clumsy birds have to uh, have, uh, have to start uh, start flying earlier. Uh, when are very young, most of our a lot of our parents and the teachers will tell us will use these uh, idioms to teach us. Uh, this idioms comes from an uh, Asian uh, story that. Uh, uh, mother bird have hatched six uh, six birdies, and the smallest one is very weak. So it's always uh, very hungry and cannot to uh, have enough uh, enough food compared with the other ones. So uh, it start to get up early and exercise more to begin uh, to became the strongest one and became uh, it becomes the first one to uh, reach the uh, destination to be, uh, become the first one of the, the the brothers so that's where our name came from yeah because we think uh, a little bit familiar with this story we actually were only four years old right now we incorporate in 2014 compared with all of the pl uh, platforms here were really young, but we think uh, if we uh, keep on innovation and uh, working hard, we can also reach the success. Uh, here are coming about actually what we are the, I mean our business, business model here. Everyone can uh, can see here that actually we are a connection from the enterprises and uh, the customers. But I think our name is very unfamiliar for for the uh, I mean for everyone here because uh, currently we are um, invisible uh, from for the customers because what we are doing is not to uh, build up uh, directly trading platforms. What we are doing is to help help the sellers, the manufacturers, to use the uh, e-commerce platforms uh, high efficiently and easily, and then sell their products to the customers all over the world. So what we are doing is like a comprehensive service platform. Uh, uh, you can see like, oh, the, the character is really small. Yeah, uh, the, we have offered like three services. The first one is the e-commerce operation, and the second one is the smart uh, marketing, and the, sec uh, the third one is supply chain services. By using all of these services, uh, the enterprises can manage their uh, online, I mean, e-commerce business very well, and then bring the high quality products to the customers. Yeah, that, so that's what, as Richard ha has uh, introduced, what we are doing. Uh, our uh, core is also like to uh, introduce the high quality enterprises to help them to sell the products to all the world. It's not, uh, I mean, all of the enterprises. And on the customer side, uh, we insist on to give the customers more choices about the high quality and the uh, safety and the uh, uh, price inflation, uh, inflation products. Uh, here I will go with our uh, quality control systems. There are five uh, aspects. The first one is the factory inspection, and the sec uh, second one is our quality control system, and the third one is the product inspection and sampling, and the first one is what we want to introduce uh, 
uh, is our traceability system that is like a tracing system. And the uh, fifth one is the guarantee deposit mechanism. So then I will explain the each part uh, detailly and I will use some example here. The first one, the first one is our uh, verification vendors. That means the factory inspection. This part is that for the every uh, manufacturer or the enterprises registered on our platforms, we will ask them to pass our uh, rules about the factory uh, inspections. Uh, we will cooperate with the uh, third party uh, certification companies to go to the uh, manufacturers to collect their uh, their information about their uh, their management and their researching and the factory uh, factory situations and then to give them like a certificate. Uh, we will issue the certificate for all of the vendors combined with the, the third party, um, third party institu uh, institutes. That means all of the manufacturers must pass our rules. We will uh, to check all of their things. So that this one is the control about the manufacturers. And the sec uh, second one is about the uh, product uh, verification. All of the products that entered our our platforms, we will uh, ask for all of the information so you can see on the left side that will uh, contains the brand, the details, and about the manufacturer information and the uh, certifications, such kind of the information. Then I will, we will also to ask them to upload their, uh, their trademarks and the uh, certificate they have to our platform, and we will collect all of the information to ensure the product. Uh, is uh, a call, uh, qualified is a qualified and uh, and safe products. And based on all of the informations and the inspections we have done, we will build up uh, a, cred a credit file based on our big data. Uh, we draw a, di a digital portrait for each registered enterprises based on big data system. We established a credit files of suppliers according to platform transactions and the monitoring data of sale and storage from overseas operation centers to control the product quality and give the enterprises quality uh, improving advices. And also if there are, uh, their products have some quality issues or there are some safety, uh, potential safety problems, all of the information will enter this uh, cre uh, credit uh, fail and we will have a record of that. And also we know that for the certificate for the uh, products is really important because that will increase the trust of the uh, customers to the products. And that also is the, uh, the manufacturer will benefit from them to make their products more competitive and can uh, by, I mean by, uh, by uh, by getting the certificates, the products can enter different uh, markets. And then here is the next step, is about the product inspection and sampling. For the first one, for the first step is about the manufacturer uh, inspection and the product thing. And here it will be related to our supply chain services. For one part is, besides the initial uh, inspection process, we will ask them to inspect the quality, uh, I mean to, to uh, Periodically, we'll ask them to send the sample to our uh, platform and to keeping the check of the uh, of the manufacturer and the products. And also for the inspection of the factories, it's not like one time inspection. We will also following the situation about the manufacturers. And also hear about the product inspection. That means not only the information upload by the manufacturer is enough, as we are offering the supply chain service for them. This means that we are uh, we offering the logistic, the trading service, and also the last mile, uh, for some of the uh, manu the sellers, we will offer them the last mile delivery services. So uh, on this part, we when their products are entering our collective warehouse in China or in the, I mean, 
in that place, we will keep checking about the products to ensure the information uh, matched with the real products on um, this way. And also, when the uh, products are entering our overseas warehouses uh, in the destination world, we will also keep following their um, quality situation and ensure the quality by this. So here comes from the tracing, uh, our tracing uh, traceability applications. As I previously have introduced, it's mostly uh, on the control methods that's on the, uh, I mean, the factory, the products, and the logistic part, the supply chain part. But and also regarding the customer, uh, the I mean, the the product safety parts, uh, we have a really. I mean that it's our responsibility like to doing to increase the trust between the sellers and the customers is really important. For some time maybe it's not like real uh, maybe there are uh, I mean the trans uh, transparency of the information and the I mean a uh, place that can given the manufacturer and the sellers to collect all of the information is really important. So that's why we create our traceability. It can, this traceability is just a name of our tracing applica uh, application. Yeah, For the products that, uh, I mean the products from the XPN systems, there will be like kind of QR code on the package of the products. And the, when the uh, customers who download their application, they can scan on the, uh, on the code and can see the, okay, can see all of the, I mean the whole, trans, uh, whole information about the products. Because it's the, I mean the character is really small here. You can see that in the, I mean the between the picture that shows the information about the uh, manufacturer, the products, and also the whole logistic information. By doing this, we think it will, it will be offering the customer a, a good way to trace the whole procedure and to uh, keep the uh, transparency of the information and can know the products is, is, is safe or to control its, uh, its quality. And also, this uh, application has also another function is that if the customer find some maybe quality uh, issues where there may be some potential safety problems, they can just uh, write uh, feedback on this application. And uh, other cu customers can see this. And also, uh, face, uh, when there is a product is unqualified or there are some uh, potential issues, we will also to show a product safety risk notice to uh, give the customers uh, alert of this. They can to see whether it, uh, uh, they, they will know that or maybe they will more uh, aware of, of that. So that's what we are doing right now. And also, as mentioned in the joint statement, uh, some for us, we have right now we are launching this traceability application. Actually, we really want it can be more popular, and it can be a way to connect the suppliers, the customers, and, and also the regulators. It can be a place each one can can join this chain and to share the information and can keep on, I mean, keep on the same pace and to solve the problems more efficiently. Yeah. Uh, here is the, the final one is about our guarantee deposit. This is this mechanism is just like to ask our supply uh, our suppliers to um, okay uh, to raising to re this way is just a way that we're using to raising the enterprises awareness of the product quality and safety to, uh, all, and also the electro uh, electro property. Uh, a property protection, and also when there is an infringe, infringement of the customers', uh, customers rights or the IP rights, we will also help the regulators to to do uh, to protect the legal rights about the customers and also other enterprises. So that just uh, five aspects what we are doing about our quality control system and our safety insure uh, system. And here is just our some basic inf uh, ideas about uh, 
about the future. Uh, first one is also we are very eager to, uh, we are willing to develop our collaboration with the, uh, the regulators to doing the inspection and using our right now systems and like the, uh, our like technique systems or the overseas warehouses. And also we are also welcome more and more suppliers and customers can enter our traceability system, can use it, uh, can use it and make it more efficiency. And also the second one is about the linkage ma uh, maximum for managing these honest companies. This is that we are very willing to cooperate with the regulators if they find some uh, suppliers or sellers who have some quality or safety issues. We are eager to uh, cooperate with them to do, to do some displaying ways or maybe to give the customer more uh, notice about this. So that's uh, just some um, share, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's just some ideas about us. Okay, thank you. Very, thank you very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I have to tell you that um, virtually everybody up here traveled um, at least hundreds and in several cases thousands of miles to be here to talk to you for 14 minutes. <laughs> and, and in each of those 14 minutes, they were loaded with the information that we wanted to know. So let's give the whole panel a really big <laughs> hand. Thank you. Now, we're not gonna be able to take questions. The time is an issue, but the questions were submitted in writing and we'll try to work something out. We'll leave the registration page up for a couple weeks and whatever we're gonna say about dealing with the questions, we'll put that on the registration page for this event so that you'll know what's going on with that. And I'll talk with the panelists and we'll see what we can do. Thank you, Patty. Anyway, um, we are gonna take a short 10 minute break, but before we break, a question had come up about whether panelists' presentations would be available. So this is how it's gonna work. If the panelists plan to make them available, uh, we'll post links to their websites from, our C from the CPSC's uh, registration page for this summit. And that will be on the, the, the CPSC summit page, registration page next week. Um, remember, if you leave this floor, you have to go through security again, so that's gonna affect your getting back. And we're gonna take a 10 minute break. So that puts us at about 3.50, I believe. Thank you.